Hello, everybody. It is Saturday night at 10 o'clock Eastern time. This is Starfleet Tactical. I am Chris Weave, as always. This week I have with me, ah, one more time in English. This week I have with me uh, Sean Barnett and Peter Gold to continue our conversation. We were going to do ship tour stuff. We were going to talk about our tours of the Wisconsin. I'd done two and these other guys each did one of them with me. But we're going to for for uh, put that one off for another week because we're going to talk about the motor vessel Dolly and spaceships and docking and all sorts of things like that. It seemed like a great opportunity since we've got, uh, um, uh, you know, Peter here is a merchant mariner who my guess is has probably been in and out of the port of uh, Baltimore at least once in his life. Mm, Baltimore? No, I haven't. I actually haven't. Well, then what good are you, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> no, Peter's, Peter, P, but Peter does know how to do this stuff. Although in all fairness to Peter, Peter's usually down in the engine room when all this shit's going down. Um, but he can, he can give us some idea of what's going on down in the engine room. And of course he's, you know, trained in all this other stuff too. Um, Sean is, uh, is uh, someone who's been around a little bit too. He's not really a, a, a merchant mariner guy by any stretch of the imagination, but he's been on lots of ships and, and he certainly has been to Baltimore and he's a smart guy. I before, have indeed been to Baltimore. So I'm going to turn it over to you to find out how your week is going in just a second. But before I do that, I want to answer a question that came up specifically. Let me find it. Okay. Hold on a second. It was specifically a question from Hermano, he said, he's got a quick question about the color of the flight decks on Nimitz class aircraft carriers. And so uh, the short answer is it's a very dark gray because it's it, it's almost black. In fact, when it's been recently resurfaced, it, it's pretty darn close to black. And that's because the flight deck is covered with something called non-skid. It's basically a hard rubber that is very rough and the idea is it provides traction when wet and so if you look at an aircraft carrier um, i can take a look at the flight deck of an aircraft carrier in a picture and i can tell you what part of their deployment they were on because what ends up happening is every time they they're getting ready for deployment they strip all the non-skid off four acres of it they because it covers the entire flight deck they strip all that stuff off and they put new on and it looks pristine. And then they go out and start doing flight ops and stuff. And you've got airplanes landing on it and tail hooks dragging across it and they're dragging chains across it, et cetera, et cetera. By the time they get back into port, it looks like the flight deck has been in a war. It hasn't. It's just normal wear and tear. And then they strip it all off and they do it again. So it's this very, very dark black blackish color it's really a dark gray but it kind of looks black so that if you do a search armano for non-skid um that should get you some my guess is that'll give you some close-up pictures there's also some things on the flight deck that are that are uh, that are perhaps different colors so that you can find them easily because there are lots of penetrations in the flight deck there are elevators there's little hatches there's place tie down little star like things that are in the deck where you can attach chains and the like Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, Peter, how was your week? What were you up to? Um, was supposed to be uh, unemployed as of yesterday, and um, the guy that's supposed to come back and relieve me, take his permanent job back, um, hasn't gotten clearance yet from the Coast Guard medical stuff. So I've had oh. another week of work. <laughs> <laughs> So now it's probably worth pointing out when he's when when Peter says, you know, could be unemployed in the very near future like that. He means not have a contract to go work on a particular ship. It's not like his, his your employer has is giving you your papers. It's just they don't have an assignment for you. Correct. So Correct. he works for a company that provides crews for lots of ships. And so it's just a matter of going to the, the bulletin board system and saying, I'd like to apply for that one and filling out the paperwork and then potentially getting to do that. Yep. So so it's not like it's not like me being unemployed where they sort of say, like, you're done, get out, you know, guards escort them out, that sort of deal. No, definitely not. Definitely not. So, so John, how about you? 
Uh, I had a good week. Uh, interestingly, I was interviewed earlier in the week by Voice of America Mandarin about the Chinese nuclear power program, which is kind of interesting because China, as you may know, gets a lot of its electric power from coal. And that is causing them problems both with air pollution, conventional air pollution, and with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. They're the world's number one greenhouse gas emitter by far. And so they are ramping up their nuclear power program to try to deal with that problem. Uh, they're building a lot of plants on the order of five plants per year in the 2020s. And so VOA Mandarin wanted to talk to me about that, uh, was interested in uh, you know safety issues in particular and what I thought about the Chinese nuclear power program. By the way, they build all their plants or most of their plants on the coast to use seawater as an ultimate heat sink but that raises issues with the tsunami risk, uh, given what happened in Fukushima. So that was an interesting conversation. That was probably the most interesting thing I did this week. Otherwise, I'm watching lots of basketball games like a lot of other people. So, Sean, why on earth would they ask you about this? Well, I am a nuclear engineer, so I know a little bit about nuclear power. I, uh, In addition to being a nuclear engineer, I was an attorney for the nuclear power industry for eight years. So I have a little bit of a background in the subject. So Sean not only can do the math, he can also do the law stuff too when it comes to these sorts of issues. Um, Fukushima is an interesting example because it, as near as I can tell, Fukushima is a really good example of why you shouldn't let the accountants have the last word. Yeah, they were warned about the tsunami hazard uh, several times before that accident happened and they essentially ignored the warning. I yeah, mean, well, had a seawall, but it was inadequate, and they were warned about that, and they just didn't fix it. Well, and in, in particular, they were warned: don't put your backup generator ca capacity on the bottom floor; put it on the top floor so it won't get flooded. Yeah. yeah, and and so a lot of people would probably be surprised to learn that you need to have an external power source to make a nuclear reactor work. They're not actually self-powering, which is the weirdest thing known to man. And the problem is, well, the issue is that when the earthquake happened, they shut them all down per you know, standard yeah. operating procedure to, to, to make them safe. But you've got the radioactive decay heat associated with the, the, the nuclear fuel inside the reactors. And you've got to run the cooling systems to remove that heat. And when the, the cooling systems were, the backup cooling systems were taken out, by the floodwaters, uh, they couldn't do it. And, and that, that's yeah. what caused the accident. And if I remember correctly, that's a, those were Westinghouse boiling water reactor designs yeah. that were designed circa what, 1960? In the 1960s, yeah. 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 Old yeah. design. But they could have they could have protected against that. If they had heeded yeah. the warning about the tsunami threat, they could have built the you know higher seawalls that could have protected them from the flooding. But unfortunately they just didn't do it. Or or and and or put all their stuff, you know, build a hill and build Move put it. their stuff on it. Yeah. So it's going to be above right. the seawater. So there's there's a lot of things they could have done. Yeah. Um, at some point, I should I should have you and my my friend Jim Bell on. Uh, Jim is a former nuclear uh, reactor inspector for the NRC. Uh, he worked at several plants. He was a reactor inspector. He was a reactor operator on board the USS Long Beach. Um. Uh, one, one of the few few ships I know of, a uh, few Navy ships I know of that had a passenger elevator. Um, so okay. we, of course, were on a, the SS Wright recently that had a passenger elevator, but most Navy ships don't. But it, but the Long Beach did. Um, it was a kind of an interesting ship, but I I never saw her in person, and I think she's razor blades now. So, but. Oh, well, so why don't we go ahead and talk about um, the MV Dolly crash and everything that happened. And I threw together some slides. We'll stop and we'll talk about each slide and uh, we'll figure out what's going on. Uh, but first, the admin phase. So next week, we're, I expect that we'll have a show. I expect to have a show in the next three weeks. I think that next week is going to be uh, Wisconsin, if, if these guys can make it. Um, and then the week after that will probably be, uh, I've been threatening to talk about La Foudre for an entire show. La Foudre was the French torpedo boat, boat carrier. It was a cruiser designed to, that was refit to carry 
at to carry torpedo boats. So we'll talk about torpedo boats and how they've changed and how they might apply in science fiction and stuff like that. Um, you've all seen pictures of La Foudre because I brought it up like 12 times, but now I'm going to do a show on La Foudre. And then I don't know what the topic is going to be the week after that. So <laughs> let's talk about the, the motor vessel Dolly. Um, first of all, and I'm pretty sure that Peter would uh, second this recommendation. If you want to find out what's going on with this, a very, very good source is Sal Mercogliano's What's Going On With Shipping channel on YouTube. Sal is a former merchant mariner who's like a professor of uh, maritime practice or some such at, uh, do you remember where he's at, Peter? Uh, North Carolina, Campbell. Yes, yes. Um, and so he started this YouTube channel when the uh, Ever Given ran aground in the Suez Canal and blocked the canal, and he's been doing it ever since, and he does fantastic work. Um, and he speaks science fiction also. He was part of, the, I, I met him through uh, NavyCon, the, one of the times where I helped out with NavyCon. So, so he does fantastic work in that regard. Um, but uh, it's worth going and taking a look at this, the stuff that he's done on it. So uh, the Dolly leaves the Port of Baltimore with two harbor pilots on board. That's totally and completely normal. I the believe lost. one was a trainee. Uh, makes uh, sense. Yeah, yeah. That that's kind of what they, uh, what Sal said is that usually when you put two on board, one's a senior guy and one's a guy under instruction, which totally and completely makes sense to me. Um, yeah, yeah. When we when we took the Martin, we had, I think, eight pilots on board. Eight. Eight. Um, one was in charge. There was like two others that were direct assistance and the rest were trainees okay uh, but we went under the martin luther king bridge in beaumont with one foot of clearance wow yeah so it was um that's why we had extra with side we had the extra senior pilots on board dead ship tow not a lot of clearance um it was a interesting maneuver yeah yeah i bet i bet so, that dead ship tote part is pretty important too yeah well that's why we had we had four tugs i believe how, we're gonna, how, how fast were you going when you did that oh underneath the bridge yeah probably one knot <laughs> you know literally somebody on top of there looking making sure Marine surveyor measuring things before we left the, the pier. Make yeah. sure nothing had changed after before we left after we left Norfolk. So anybody who wants to see pictures of the Martin, um, I think it was like around episode 75, if I remember correctly. I I looked it up not too long ago. So I think it's episode 75. I could be wrong about that, but but uh I took a tour of the Martin. Um, and so uh took a lot of pictures, pictures of various areas inside, inside the lifeboat, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can go and take a look at that. Um, that's, that ship is, have they actually broken her up yet? I believe they have. I yeah. believe they have. Um, so, somebody showed me pictures of her being cut up in Brownsville. Yeah. Um, progress is sometimes sad. Yeah. So, yeah. So in any event, Dolly left port with two harbor pilots on board, totally normal, lost power in the channel, not normal. That's not how that usually works. Um, collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge, also not normal. When, the, when they collided with the bridge, the bridge collapsed. That is normal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mentioned that because there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there that where people are just like off the rocker talking about, you know, there's no way that it could bring down a bridge and stuff like that. And that's garbage. <laughs> um, if you look at the stats here, it's displacement of 148,000 tons. I think it's, I think it says 148. It's actually kind of hard to read when I, it's, it's small and I want to say it's 148. Um, so it's, it's a big ship. Um, it's a very big ship and it is, um, 
It's a very long ship. In fact, to give you an idea how long, that's what we're talking about. So not the biggest container ship out there, but it is a pretty good size ship. You know, it is as long yeah. as the um, lower right hand corner. No, that's not that's not the dolly underneath. The dolly is okay. 300 meters. Oh, OK. So yes. it's so it's closer to the size of the Enterprise. Yeah. 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 But still a good size ship. And when you look on the left hand side, you can see, first of all, look at that little car up there for scale. And you can see how much clearance there was um, to the top of the to the deck of the bridge and how much water she had underneath her at the time. Um, and, you know, and it gives you some idea of how big that structural support is compared to the size of the ship. Yeah. Yeah. A, a collision is going to take something down. The only way to prevent it is to pour concrete or something around the abutment so that the, the ship hits the abutment, you know, the dolphins, um, or, or a, a, like an island around the, the, the structure before it can actually hit the structure itself. And even that may be questionable. Yeah. I mean, it, it's got a. It's a 146,000 tons moving at eight knots. So yeah. moving at approximately 10 miles an hour. Well, I think that actually, I think when it, when it hit, it was moving at, at closer to seven, 6.8, I think is the number. In fact, I think I've got it here on the timeline. Um, so here's the timeline. The thing to take away from this in my mind is the complete blackout happens at 124 in the morning and the collision happens at 128 and 45 seconds. So I don't know if it happened. I doubt it. I doubt the ship lost power at exactly 124, right? But e even if it did, under five minutes from we've lost power to crunch. And in that time period, they called the bridge control and said, close the bridge. They were able to close the bridge on both ends of the bridge. They called for the tugs to come back to them because the, the tugs don't hang out when they're going at eight knots down the channel. They called for the tugs to come back to them. And the tugs were on their way back and just couldn't make it in time. Um, I don't have a feel for whether they were having mechanical issues beforehand. There's been some reports that they were having pro power problems before they left dock. I don't know about anything about that, but in terms of their reaction to the crisis, this sort of sounds like everybody had their act together, that they were doing what they were, they were supposed to do. Now, Peter, tell me, am I wrong about that? No, but there's an awful lot of unanswered questions. Such as? All right, so we don't know why they lost power. Yeah. Okay. Um, that could be the talk on some of the boards I'm on is possibly bad fuel mix. They, they took on fuel um, and it was incompatible with the fuel they already had on board. It was too dirty. Um any kind of a mechanical fault with the with the ship in terms of the electrical generation um that we're going to have to wait till we get some more information there as to why they lost power um uh, it happens it's happened to me um you know it's not you have, it's a major incident you have to report it to the coast guard if you do um but you know, as long as you can figure out why, I mean, I was on one ship, you know, they talk about bugs. We got a technician on board and he took the system apart. He physically found a cockroach <laughs> in the, inside the automation system for the switchboards. It's like, okay, <laughs> we found the bug. Um, there's a story I got from a acquaintance 
an acquaintance, a friend of an acquaintance on Facebook. Uh, they lost steering, not not electrical. They lost steering, um, loose fuse block. You know, okay, they lost steering and they um, they hit something because of that. Uh, it happens. So until yeah. we get more information, <clears throat> you know, I I've seen. I've seen a couple of times and heard way more times about Navy stuff where they're doing like underway replenishments and they'll lose steering or something like that. Yeah. Um, in fact, they, we always practiced uh, emergency breakaways um, because sometimes you, you need to get the ships far apart quick. Um, and it might be that something in the outside world is happening like, oh, there are bad guys coming. Or it might be like, like a cable snaps or something like that. Uh, the last, in fact, I think this might have been the very last emergency breakaway I ever saw, because um, I think it was, I think it was during my last, my last carrier trip, which was the last time I went to sea, which would have been November. No, it wouldn't have been the last time I went to sea. The last time I went to sea was November of 2004. This would have been in April of 2004, I think. Um, uh, I was on the catwalk on board the carrier. Usually I watched underway replenishments from the flag bridge. Um, but this time I was actually out on the catwalk cause I had never been outdoors on a carrier watching an underway replenishment. So I went out on the, on the catwalk with one of my colleagues and something happened um, with the ship that was doing the unrep on the other side of the oiler. So it wasn't on our side, it was on the other side, but, the, but they called an emergency breakaway you know, this is not a drill. And they said, and the big voice said, clear the catwalk, we're going to maneuver. And it's like, oh shit. <laughs> um, and uh, Scott and I got inside the skin of the ship pretty damn fast, pretty damn fast. And then the, the ship did one of those <clears throat> to get away from the oiler so the oiler could get away from the from, from the ship that was having the issue. I can't remember if it was a snap cable or if it was steerage. This, it sounds more like a steerage sort of thing. So, so Peter, when you, when a ship like that uh, loses electric power, do they lose the ability to, uh, do they lose the rudder control at that point? As long as the, as, if there's no power on the ship, they have no rudder. It's, it's electro hydraulic of some sort. Um, there's a couple, couple of different designs out there. Um, but they're all basically hydraulic now um, and have been for 50 years. Um, so is the emergency power enough to give you rudder? Yes, it's supposed to be. But a lot of the ships, it only has to do it 50% of the rate. Yeah. So if right. it's normally hard over to hard over is... And there's actually a regulation on this, how fast it has to be. Um, it would it would only give you half of that power rate. Yeah, and and Chris Carlson said that when he was watching it, he was watching it with a stopwatch because he's Chris Carlson and he does shit like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, his his comment was uh, when I talked with him earlier today was that as he's watching them as the lights are coming back on, he's going too fast, too fast, too fast. And then they went off again. So he thinks that they, he thinks that they were pretty desperate to get the power back. You know, of course they were pretty desperate to get the power back. They were pretty desperate to get the power back and they overloaded the circuit and, and popped a circuit breaker. Yeah. Um, it's almost as if the, it's almost as if we didn't see the emergency generator come on. But we may have seen the the main generator come on too quickly. Uh, that they, because they brought the main back instead of the emergency. Um, possibly. Um, there is a it, very good chance that the EDG came on, took the load, and sometimes the ships, some ships, but not all. Um, you have to manually disconnect the EDG and bring the um and connect the, reconnect the main the emergency circuitry back to the main bus other ships it's automatic as soon as you bring the main generator online 
it drops the emergency generator the, the emergency generator off of the bus uh, and you'll see a flicker but usually that that flicker is in is under is in microseconds well it's real quick so much is, so when you say manually switch over what's what are we talking about how how complicated an evolution is that um my my guess is it's more complicated than set SCE to aux. Yeah, um, we had to do this for automation testing. We had a brand new automation system installed, and we were testing everything. Uh, so we actually had to. One of the things we had to do was trip the plant uh, in stages, and so in this case, we blacked out um my team did really great job we actually had a compliment from the u.s coast guard about it edg comes on um then to shift it we have to reset up one breaker in one location manually and then go to where the edg is manually trip it and reset the breaker there so um, you could do it single-handedly, but we usually try and do it with radios two-handed so to reduce the, to reduce the issues. Okay. Um, I said the ship I was on last year, which I, you never actually got a tour of, but it was a, or another row row. Mm -hmm. um, it was automatic. You know, you, when we shifted back to um, main power, the EDG would trip up, would go offline. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so. if you if you all remember from that famous World War II battle of Washington versus Kirishima versus South Dakota at one of the naval battle part of the naval battle of Guadalcanal, um, South Dakota had some issues with their electrical system, and they had they had things rigged the wrong way. And basically, I think it was they fired their guns and their and their electrical system went offline, if I remember correctly, the shock of firing. That's, that's what I remember too, yeah. Yeah. Now, now um, the thing to keep in mind about uh, about South Dakota, this, and this is, I, you know, this is worth emphasizing. That was her shakedown cruise. She got to fight a battle for her shakedown cruise. Um, she was so brand spanking new she had just got in theater. They had rushed her to get her in theater. So she was a new ship and hadn't had a chance to sort of, you know, work all the kinks out in terms of the crew stuff, you know, new crew, new ship, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, my first thought was how could, how could these bozos do something that, that all the, all the books basically said was pretty elemental that they got it wrong. And then I heard, uh, oh, yeah, she's on her shakedown cruise. And I, you know, OK, roger that. Um, I'll give them props for going and fighting a battle for their shakedown cruise. Good for them. Yeah. I mean, if they hadn't gone through, if they hadn't fired the guns or done shock testing, something broke loose that they didn't know had to be secured properly because the yard hadn't done it initially. Yeah. And they, they had their circuits wired in such a way that when one went down, it took them all down. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, shit happens. That's why you, that's why you do, that's why you have shakedown, shakedown cruises. Shakedown cruises, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so as it is right now, it looks like the current death toll looks like it's six, um, yeah. which seems to be pretty much from the road crew that was working on the bridge. And uh, I think it could have been much, much, much worse. Yeah. Okay. So here's the track data. Um, if you go and watch Sal, Sal's got a nice synchronized thing where it's got a, it's mostly synchronized with the camera view of it hitting the bridge. And he's got a track data that shows all of the information I've got here, except it's in one illustration rather than two. What we've got here on the right is the actual track. On the left, we've got the, uh, that's the, the lighter area is the shipping lane. And so um, the ship had to go through the main part of the span. 
And as you can see, that's exactly where the shipping lane, and it wasn't that far out of the lane, far enough, but it wasn't that far out of the lane. And one of the comments that Sal made that, that I haven't really sort of sat down and figured it out, there's lots of little, you know, estuaries and this and that and the other thing there. I have no idea what the current looks like around there. And he said that something to the effect of that he thinks that that they may have had a current that was that the reason why they lost uh, the track, you know, you'd think, OK, I lost power. I just keep going in the same direction. Right. But if you've got, got a current and, and or wind pushing you, it can push you in a particular direction. And he thinks that that's part of what happened here. Um, bank effect is what he was saying. <laughs> bank effect. Yes. Tell me about bank effect. Okay, so this is more of a decky thing. I'm an engineer. <laughs> okay. There so, will not be a test. Yeah. <laughs> so when your ship is going, when there is um, underwater land or even just above water land to one side, um, with the way the, the hydrodynamics, it... I think it pulls it in somehow. Um, yeah. And the venturi effect. Yeah. And if you take a look at the, uh, and Sal does cover this, um, the, how can I, I can't do anything with this, can I? Um, so that incoming long, channel um so when you're coming you're coming down the main channel on that track line when you see that in that other channel that branches off to what would be to starboard that yeah, could change left, left on our view yeah left on our view that would change the bank effect underwater and possibly change where the ship wants to steer a little bit as far as I know, I'm not a helmsman. Or, well, I haven't had to steer a ship in since high school. Uh, well, no, college. Um, and that was at open water. Um, you, know, you get a, a minor correction with the helm, no big deal. You lose power. You get the correction put on just before you lose power, and now you're um, stuck going down the track with a little bit of rudder on possibly yeah. sal's got a much better explanation i believe it is it's, um, it's worth looking at, at at sal's stuff yeah yeah and whatever he doesn't have listed um i think it was casual navigation which he recommends yep casual um, navigation is pretty good yeah that um i'll put that into the links um if i can get this thing to why is it doesn't want to? Yeah, I put it in the uh, YouTube chat uh, for the the channel, not the individual videos. Um, the they've got an explanation showing graphics of uh, how the bank effect works. One of the two channels, or one of the channels I've watched recently. Yeah, you know, I, I seriously considered sending a message to Sal and asking him if he wanted to join us. Um, and I, I decided not to because I think he's with, with overseas press, et cetera, et cetera. I think he's basically doing interviews 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he was real nice. He, he got on with Ward Carroll, uh, yeah. the guest recently about that and you know had to be fitted in between cnn and msnbc yeah so, yeah so uh, I, i'm i decided not to you know i i want to ask him to come on the show at some point we can talk you know science fiction and ship handling and stuff like that but and merchant marine stuff um but but this is not the time <laughs> to yeah do it, so yeah yeah he can talk nathan <laughs> stuff extensively so, but um uh, let's see. I think I'm done with that slide. Let me go to the next one. Okay. So, all right. So we've spent a lot of time talking about how to think about ports and 
ship maneuvers and stuff like that and how this can happen. Let's talk a little bit about Star Trek. Um, and Space Dock drives me crazy. <laughs> the entire idea of Space Dock drives me crazy. And the reason why it drives me crazy is that you see ships maneuvering within space dock on under their own power. And I've got some stats here. The galaxy class RCS numbers come from the holy book of Sternbach and Okuda, the Star Trek Next Gen Tech Manual. So the RCS has two thrust tubes, two thruster vents, and they you can either fire one or the other or both of them together. If you fire both of them together, you get 5.2 million newtons of thrust. If you fire one of them, it's about 3 million newtons of thrust. And the F1 engine on the Saturn V is 7.8 million newtons of thrust. So it's about two thirds of, of an F1 engine every time if you fire the RCS at maximum. And so it just seems insane to me that you would be having the equivalent of F1 engines, even throttled down F1 engines, operating inside an enclosed space, regardless of the fact that that enclosed space is that big, because you're still throwing out matter that's moving at a pretty good clip and is gonna impact off of stuff. Now, I'm sure somebody's at this point is getting ready to say shields, to which my response is, okay, you know, yeah, but, why not just move the ships around with tractor beams? Why are they underpowered? I would think that you would move them around with tractor beams. Unless, of course, the, the thrusters are actually reactionless, but I'm not sure if that's... No, they're thrown plasma. Okay. They're thrown plasma, um, at least according to the book of Sternbach. Um, so, and even so, you know, it's it, it just, I don't, I don't understand what what space dock gets them. It just, it just strikes me. It's a difficult maneuvering situation. You've got, you potentially have uh, many ships that are maneuvering. You've got this big central structure in it. Why bother? Um, why not? It, especially since you saw the, 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 the dock facility in like Star Trek, the motion picture, they clearly had it someplace else. And with transporters and shuttlecraft, why why do you care why do you why do you need to actually hard dock um one horse Shea says impulse is throwing plasma but not the thrusters i'm almost positive I, I read it fairly recently i'm almost positive that that those thrusters are throwing plasma too they've got fusion reactors behind them and they're talking about thrust now, maybe they're not going, they're not ramping all the way up because you do have subspace fields and stuff that you could use to lower the mass of the ship. That's how they move Deep Space Nine from its original location to being right next to the wormhole. Um, but on the flip side, um, do, you, do you really want to be generating a subspace field inside your living room? I mean, the, I, do you want to generate this inside the building? I, I don't think you do. I suspect do. not. I suspect not. Yeah, I suspect that this is this just strikes me as being something that has way too many things that could go wrong. So, so that's my thought on the Star Trek side of things. And and you know, you got transporters. Why do you why do you ever need to to hard dock? I mean, maybe for maybe for bulk fluid transfer or something like that. Uh, the and uh, the Galaxy class has a set of ports on the spine, and so the idea is that it can it can dock. Uh, with its spine up to the ports, including um, including a an uh, elevator shaft tube for the for the fancy elevators, so that you can actually get on get on the Galaxy class and take a uh, take a, a car that will take you to wherever you want to go on the station. So that's a pretty good good trick. I understand why you might want to do that. Um, Stephen Ross points out. Kirk ordering one quarter impulse in port. And it's like that, 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 that's insane. That that's insane. Yeah. Well, that's the trying to carry the maritime metaphor too far, probably. 
Yeah. You know, because you've come off the pier at dead slow ahead um, when maneuvering. Yeah. Now, speaking of carrying the ma naval metaphor too far, let's take a look at this. So this is from Razor. It's the Scorpion Fleet Yard um, from Battlestar Galactica Razor. And I don't know about you, Peter. I look at that and that looks like a port. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, now, these people don't have tractor beams to solve what I call the reactor control thrusters or strategic weapons problem. Um <laughs> But there, you know, there, there's some, I, I really question this design in some very, very fundamental ways, because I don't see why this thing doesn't just all sort of twist apart, right? Um, um, you know, space does have stresses and parts of stations move at different, the, the stations move, right? So you, they, they orient in the gravity field, etc. And so I would think that this would cause some problems. The things that I like about it, though, there, there's two in particular. One is, it's tough to see in this particular illustration, probably, but there are rail yards, rail lines that go along there connecting all the ships. And everybody may remember from last week's show um, that I pointed out that there's a rail, uh, rail line that goes right down the pier, right up to the ship. So you can bring in heavy stuff on rail. And that's exactly what we see here. And there's even some drawings. I didn't include them here, obviously. There's even some drawings where the rails run on, on the top and the bottom because it's actually oriented in both directions. And there's places where it'll it'll turn and it'll also do, do um, a roll so you can switch from a top track to a bottom track or vice versa. It's actually pretty cool. The other thing I like is you see the reason why you have that notched hammerhead design on the battle stars. That's actually designed to plug in to the shipyard. So when they the, there's a reason why they're pulled in nose first like that. The hammerhead sort of slots into place and is locked into place somehow. Now the the battle stars are possibly large enough that. You undock everything, and if your thrusters are only on the stern and are relatively small, um, you may be able to back out. So when he says only on the stern, he does not mean the big-ass engines that would push them into the station. He's talking about some other reaction control thrusters that are that far back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, this. there's a variation of this problem that you see in um, in uh, landing on the moon, right? Every moon landing where something is taken off again afterwards has left a stage behind, right? The lunar module left a stage behind. <clears throat> Part of the reason why they did that is because they were afraid of damage to the first stage caused by the landing. Because when you get close to the ground, you're kicking up a bunch of dirt and shit, rocks and stuff like that. You know, anybody who saw that first Starship launch and saw the, the uh, concrete tornado that they created um, when, they, when they lit off all the engines can kind of understand the issues with letting off rockets close to the ground. And SpaceX's human landing system entry, which is a modified starship, um, is talking about having like super Dracos, which is their um, their next smaller size rocket, the one that they have in like the Dragon ca capsule for the escape system, having super Dracos partway up the ship so that you're not using a rocket engine at the very bottom. You're using one part way up so that it doesn't get into the, it doesn't interact with the lunar surface when it's landing. And so if you had, if you had backup thrusters on the tail end of these battle stars, you know, 2000 feet away from the station, yeah, maybe you could do that. Maybe you can make that work. Yeah. Especially and if you had a bunch of them and none of them were lit off full power. Yes. And also, you know, it may take quite a while to, um, to move the ship out of dock. Yeah. You know, um, 
and I, I've never tried this, but you know, in theory, you can take you can stand on the pier at the bow of a uh, destroyer and just lean into it, and eventually it'll start moving. Yeah, you know, if, if it's not tied off and you don't have anything else uh, pushing back, you know, so no reason you couldn't do that. You know, we don't see it, and I'm going to brainstorm here. Maybe it takes 45 minutes to get back far enough that you can uh, throw more power on it. Yeah. And the other thing is there might be actually some big sort of hydraulic pistons or something that sort of push it away. Yeah. We saw that with the, um, the stern ramp doors on the uh, Roros because the, the Roro doors are um, often leaning into the ship a little bit so you have to push them away from the ship to get the um to get them beyond the pivot point yeah yeah um and you have to do that and you want to do it slowly so you don't um throw all the weight of the ramp onto the uh wires under the cables that are controlling it yeah i can i can understand that 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 that's a recurring theme that i see in uh, star trek especially seems to be bad about that is when when they're when they're in close proximity and like they're leaving, things happen way too fast, right? It's one thing when you're breaking orbit and there's nobody around you, but when when you're like like space the, the when they leave space dock in the movies, it seems really really slow, unless you've actually left a port before, in which point it seems radically fast. Well, they just don't want to spend the time in the film. Oh, I I totally get it. I totally get it. I mean, I I mean it, it. It they do it that way for a reason. Um. But it's it is something that when you sort of look at it and and you spend any time around ships, you go, yeah, okay, okay. I I understand why you're doing that, but that that strikes me as being way fast. Would you agree yeah. with that, Peter? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um. Unless you have some system that's going to solve some of these issues and they may um but they don't mention them way too fast um you know in a book you just jump scene it yeah you know um yeah all you need is the sentence two hours later we had cleared dock and we were ready to open up with the mains yeah um i think for nathan lowell's he mentions I think either 45 minutes or a couple of hours from, yeah, for, that, for pullout. That that totally makes sense. Wright asked yeah. the question, didn't in Star Trek three the Enterprise turnover control to the yard master for a ride into space dock? To be honest, I don't remember. It's been so long since I've watched that movie. Which, you know, I have on my list of things to do for this show. I want to do all of Star Trek, you know, including the animated series. Um, up through uh, when the JJ verse starts, and just that watch is admirable, Chris, and just watch an episode a day for literally two years. That is admirable, um, but I haven't gotten there yet. So one other example I've got here is CJ Cherry's Down Below Station, and this is notable <coughs> for the insanity of docking on the rim of these star stations. Now, the stations are huge. I mean, the carriers that you see there um, have a crew of like 2,000. And they're described as being the size of small space stations themselves. And they're docking with these things that are huge. I mean, we're talking, you know, mile or more across. Um, she never gives any numbers on anything. So she she doesn't let herself get tied down to numbers and stuff. Yeah. And she does talk about when they when they dock with the station, they have to move mass around to compensate for the fact that they've got this big ass ship attached to them. But even so, docking on the rim sort of strikes me as being uh, kind of crazy. And the way that they dock is crazy, too. I mean, the station is rotating. Yeah, there's no there's no artificial gravity in her world, as far as I know. There's no artificial gravity. There's no tractor beams. The station is rotating, 
and they, you know, they, the station is rotating and they come in and they dock with the rotating thing. And, um, you know, I've got the big suspend disbelief button and I have to sort of battle short it in place. <laughs> um, because I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of pressing it with both hands to keep the button down so I can suspend disbelief on stuff like this. Um, don't get me wrong. I love CJ Cherry's work. I love the Alliance Union universe. It's fantastic. Down Below Station is one of my favorite novels. Hellburner about the creation of the the Hellburner uh, class writers, which you see there is the small ships off to one side. Um, it, that's that's they're both fantastic novels. They're 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 great. And I like most of the things that she's got in terms of how the station operations work, et cetera, et cetera. But the docking and undocking part of this is just insane. It's just insane. Um, Scott G says something about Babylon 5, and I, I'm kicking myself. I, why didn't I include Babylon 5 in this? Um, Babylon 5 has, of course, a rotating core and a, uh, a rectangular entry point going into the core and the ship and the ships coming in start doing the rotation it's unclear to me once they get inside what happens to them because not everybody can dock on the center line they've got to move off to one side it's unclear to me how that exact process happens but but at least they start off that way so Delon says he just did a quick search on YouTube and in Star Trek three, they do turn over to space dock. So, um, so I should have included, I should have included Babylon five in this. Um, that would have been another good one. In fact, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go ahead and create a slide. So the next time I do this presentation, I've got one on Babylon five. Yeah. So here's a few thoughts about spaceports versus seaports. Seaports, you've got a lot of things you need to take into account. You've got currents, and that includes things like that bank effect that Peter talked about. You've got wind, you've got water depth and sort of the interactions off the off the bottom there. Not as big a deal if you're going slow, but like there, like there are certain places where if you're going fast water depth can either work to your advantage to make you go faster or it can cause problems. And so you are speed limited um, in certain water depths. You've got shore infrastructure that you have to worry about. And by, in this case, like bridges and stuff, right? Because they build stuff over the waterway. Um, and there's a limited amount of places to put shore infrastructure. And so the, where you can put shore infrastructure, also the, the stuff that has to interact with the ship determines where the ships need to go. Yeah. Another aspect is the technology you're using. Uh, yeah. Prior to containerization, I'm not sure if we mentioned this before in this show, um, you had ships tying up all along Manhattan, yeah. all along Brooklyn, Going into, you know, stuff was coming off, going into warehouses and being distributed in the city by, I don't know, by whether, you know, they started off with horse drawn to, you know, regular diesel trucks. But um, when they started bringing containerization in, that's when they had to go out to um, the middle of nowhere. Yeah, Elizabethtown. Yeah. You know, because they just needed the, the lay down area. They need a place to put all these boxes that were going to come off really, really quickly, relatively speaking, you know, a ship unloads in a day versus a break bulk that might be there two weeks. Um, and you couldn't really predict how long it was going to be. That was the other thing. You couldn't predict it. Whereas, whereas you know how many containers an hour you can move. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much pretty close. And so you've got a big rail yard, you've got big stacking yards that, that you can put stuff if you need to move it temporarily. You've got a, a series of trucks that just truck pulls up, they put a container on it, truck moves, next truck pulls up, they put a container on it, it moves, and it takes it to wherever it needs to go for the next step, which might very well be a crane putting it onto a railroad uh, car to take off to its next step. Yeah. Um, back when you had, you know, New York used to be a really big port. 
and as as Peter said, and you had ships tied up. And because it was a big port, it meant that there was something else about New York. It had factories. You had factories in the city in a way that you don't you don't generally have factories inside cities like that in the in the same way that you did previously. Right. They sort of now they have a tendency to be out towards the periphery. Um, but you it used to be that you had you had all the manufacturing inside the city because that's where the that's where the ports were and that's where the dock workers were and that's where the factory workers were. Um, the other thing about that is factories used to be tall, right? They were multi-story buildings. So why would you like build cars in a tall factory? Well, the answer was <coughs> they were steam powered. So you had a boiler down below and with a turbine that rotated a shaft and the shaft went straight up because it's easier to do this with a vertical shaft than with a horizontal shaft. So you'd have a vertical shaft that went straight up and then you'd have belts coming off the shaft to power whatever local gear you had. And so when electricity came along, the first thing you do is you replace that big steam engine with an electric, a big electric engine. And then, and then people started saying, why do I need a big electric engine? Why don't I just use small electric engines? And factories went from being tall buildings and you had to deal with internal ramps to move stuff around and elevators and all that other shit that caused you, made it a lot more complicated. Factories went from being tall buildings to being spread out buildings. Yeah, I think the other the other shift was depending upon the material being done. I mean, the garment industry in New York City is still relatively tall buildings. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, you've got to move the the different levels of the garments around. Um, but, you know, each step of the way you can move it between between places. It's not like a it's automobile not like a car. Yeah, it's not like a car factory. Um, you know, where especially, you know, the car, of course, you know, once you you build it and get it off, you put a little bit of gas in it, fire it up and drive it to the staging yard. And then you put it on either a train or a truck or whatever. You know, so it's yeah. kind of self-propelled there. There's a great book on factories called Behemoth. I think it's called Behemoth. Yes, it is. I've got yeah. it on Audible. It's, yeah, it's fantastic. And it talks about the history of the factory, it starts with um, English English mills, which were horrible, U.S. mills, which were not, um, Ford and Fordism, exporting Fordism to the Soviet Union in the 30s. And then it just it goes all the way up to to basically the modern factory system. And it explains all these things along how how each generation things changed. It's a fantastic book. Yeah. So um, spaceports all, you know, this, the one I chose in the, as an example here, Space Station 5 from 2001 is not an example of this idea that spacecraft are generally much bigger and more powerful um, than you see things on the surface of the ocean. But, but as a general rule, I mean, like science fiction does big really well. And as things get bigger, supplementary systems um, end up being closer and closer to being strategic weapons, right? Um, if your reaction control thruster is the power of a Saturn V engine, or in the case of like in the Honorverse, the radars that they have in the warships in the Honorverse would be considered um, uh, microwave weapons mm -hmm. by us today. You know, you just burn out everything um, if you if you sent a radar pulse at close range because it's a radar pulse that's designed to go across light seconds and give you meaningful data across light seconds. Um, so spaceports have to deal with levels of energy and sizes of things that are dramatically more than any seaport has to deal with. Yeah. On the flip side, I kind of look at it. It's like, why do you need to do dock your big spacecraft? Why don't you just use lighters? Why don't you just unload it in orbit and either, you know, move it around in orbit or, you know, you've got you've got the down port that you bring stuff down to. Like, um, although in some cases, in some science fiction, it, it's all very heavily assumptions dependent. In some science fiction, if you've got 
like in Star Star Wars. I'm going to do something I very rarely do, which is use Star Wars as an example. Um, <laughs> in Star Wars, you've got the ability to sort of hover a Star Destroyer over a ground situation, right? You see that in <laughs> yeah. Rogue One. <laughs> um, they've got really pretty good anti-gravity, so they could do that. You could easily imagine a freighter the size of a Star Destroyer coming down close enough to the ground that, that, that there's a guy on board the ship handing boxes to a guy on the ground, right? <laughs> you wouldn't do it that way, but you could imagine that. You could at least imagine getting close enough that you, you're, you're lowering stuff. You've got a crane on board and you're lowering stuff in the crane, using the crane or, or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, there's some science fiction I've seen where the ships all end up in the water and they sort of treat them like ship. They literally treat them like ships um, because it's just easier to do things at, at a seaport than it is to try to put a ship that big down on the ground. Um, yeah. Bill Baldwin's Helmsman series, for instance, is like that. The other part about ports is, um, is you need the, the ability to distribute stuff you know you got a, whole, a huge ship or any kind of a ship that comes in to um whether it's um up in orbit or down on the ground how do you then distribute it to the rest of the planet um yeah with, you know and um and take a, i mean i guess the other thing you'd look at is when were the books when was that book written um uh, if it was written well after containerization became well known, um, you know, you'd expect them just to, to be using containers. Anything earlier, um, Andre Norton's Solar Queen series, written yeah. in, in the fifties or sixties, it's all break bulk, yeah, you know, from the, from the description. So you're going to want to land that sh that ship as close to where you're going to end up, um, rather than unload it by hand, move it onto something else, and, you know, a couple of times. And the, the other thing about Andre Norton stuff is they were all tail sitters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a, as a general rule. Now, um, galactic derelict and, and that sort of stuff may not be, but even things like, you know, star Rangers, that was supposedly pretty far down, whatever timeline that series took place in. Um, that was a tail sitter. Yeah, again, you know, that's the assumptions of, of the era of, you know, well, this is how ships are going to work. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see if we come up with a new real world method of maritime transportation in terms of cargo handling, how long it takes to get into science fiction and how that impacts things. Yeah, and, and that that that's a good question. Um, and... Um... CJ Cherry never really addresses it. You've got things like can haulers and stuff like that, but she doesn't really, the one time she talks about cargo handling that I remember, now I, there's one or two books in that series I haven't read yet. Um, the one time that she talks about cargo handling I remember is the cargo transfer in TriPoint. Um, when they're moving stuff, um, they're moving stuff in space from one ship to another. And it's essentially break bulk. Some pretty big containers of stuff, but it's not, there isn't like a containerized cargo system that they're using to move stuff around. They're kind of doing it by hand. <laughs> yeah, she wrote that. She wrote that starting in the early 80s. Yeah. I mean, TriPoint was probably early 90s when it came out. Yeah, but if she's not following the maritime industry, um, she may not have been aware. You know, I mean, how many people, yeah. you know, they, they look at a ship, oh, it's a tanker. Well, no, it's not. It's a container ship, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there's... Um, can doing container stuff and doing doing shipping right is harder than it seems in science fiction in part and the other thing is i don't think most authors truly appreciate 
the volume of trade that takes place. Um, Steve Miller and Sharon Lee's Leaden series, you know, they're, they're, they're these big trading houses. And whenever they talk about the cargo, the, um, the, the amount of cargo they're talking about seems really, really small. The number of ships seems really, really small. And don't get me wrong, I love the, that series, but, but I don't read that series because I think it's a, um, a to use to, for lack of a better term, a realistic representation of what of what cargo in space might look like. Yeah, yeah. Even Nathan says that. You know, we've called we've called them out in the Facebook group. You know, the numbers seem to contradict occasionally, but there's enough wiggle that you know. The usual explanation is that the Ishmael doesn't necessarily know enough to remember it correctly you know yeah so the, so the later information is better than the early information um so and th that series by the way if you haven't read the nathan lowell um tales of the solar clipper tales of the solar clipper am i remembering yes that? yeah. yeah that's the yeah, old yeah. You really need to go read that stuff. The books are really fantastic. And I always joke that their their books were nothing happens. At one point they thought about having something happen and then they thought something they thought better about it. But they're just so incredibly well written. Um they're they're not I it, they're not boring, but they're very interesting books about sort of the workaday life of this guy as he goes from an apprentice who really needed a job and, and was willing to take, take it on working his way up to captain. Yeah. So Wright has an interesting comment here. <laughs> so, um, to the best of my knowledge, did Burt Reynolds make any science fiction movies? <laughs> I don't think Burt Reynolds made any science fiction movies. That's worth a quick check. Yeah, I can't think of anything. <laughs> oh, um, for right, have you ever see, have you seen the greatest beer run ever by Chick Donahue? No. Uh, true story. Guy got on a ship in New York City, um, going to Vietnam, took cargo over there, and he brought a whole bunch of beer with him and distributed it to his buddies that were in the Marine Corps or the Army over there. <laughs> hmm. That sounds like it could be fun. Yes, it, it, there's got some good scenes in it. Yeah, and if you go um, for anybody, you know, la last episode I talked about the box by Mark Levinson, which I've talked about before, and which Peter agrees is a really good book. Um, uh, one of the things he talks about in there is how container shipping, re Vietnam was really where container shipping made its its um, its public debut. Right, there had been some stuff beforehand, but but container shipping was really where um, where it shone for the first time, all the advantages of container shipping worked really well because one of the things is, you know, they'd, they, they were bringing relatively small ships into relatively small ports. And then you just load it onto a, load the container directly onto a truck and drive it wherever you needed it. I suspect those are probably 20 foot containers and not forties, um, which is sort of the standard these days. Um, but it worked out really well for that. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm not sure that I've got anything else to say on this topic. Um, Peter, do you have anything else to say on this topic? Um, I was going to say, the, um, do you even need ports? A good, the, we, my history professor had a thing. Had, so we spent an hour, one hour lecture on 
um, about ports um, and how you what's required for them. And there's actually a couple of books about it out there. Um, you know, all it's all about the you know, where are you are you gonna where are you gonna consolidate stuff um, before yeah. moving it. So, I mean, a port is an interface between the sea and the land. Yeah. Um, a spaceport, you know, an airport is an interface between the air and the land. The thing is, you can put an airport anywhere. Yeah. Within within reason. Yeah, right? land, right? Any place yeah. you've got land or a ship, um, you can put an airport in a lot of different places. There are some constraints. You know, mountains are problematic. Um, Leyte was problematic, right? We had entire major operation of World War II that was based upon the assumption that the guy who said that the ground uh, on Leyte was good enough to build uh, runways for heavy bombers was correct. And the other guy who said, no, 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 it is not good enough. You're, you're wasting your time was wrong. Turns out that second guy was correct. So we conducted a major operation of World War II to, a, to seize an island that was useless to us. <laughs> Um, and this was a point that my old boss used to make when I was a professor at the Naval War College, because the, the War College had this big deal about talking about the Leyte campaign. It was one of their their operations. And and Jim did not make any friends over in that department by saying, and what was the result of seizing that island? We successfully seized the island. What was the result? And the answer was, yeah, nothing, nothing. We liberated the people on Leyte. We liberated the people of Leyte, but never never made a decent heavy bomber field there because the ground was the ground was basically spongy and it just wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth trying. So so yeah, I mean if you've if you've got the ability to sort especially if you've got something like anti-gravity and you've got the ability to sort of drop modules wherever you want. Um you know, I I could easily see a situation in the honorverse, for instance, where the shuttle the local UPS guy stops by the uh, the the freighter and picks up the container and takes it directly to the to the um, to the end user and doesn't bother to take it to any sort of intermediate stop. But it, it is a distribution issue, right? It, it's it's yeah. convenience of distribution. You yeah. know, there's a, there's a, a guy named Mark Mark Benninger, if I remember correctly, that that wrote a book called The Control Revolution, which I'll be honest, I've never been able to make my way through it. It's the first chapter. The first part of that book is really, really rough. It is not an easy read. But his premise is that people come up with new technology and then it basically has a sort of a brief spurt and then it collapses and then you have to come up with a new control technology to go along with it in order to really make it work. Like, for instance, the railroad, the idea of railroads are fantastic, but railroads only work if you've got telegraphs and warehousing to go along with it, because otherwise you can a uh, railroad can never meet its full, full potential. And so you need to have these other things to go along with it. Um, and it's like a capability building, right? You need all the elements of, of capability starting with doctrine and ending with the. Uh, yeah. 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 Just, just figuring out how to use something. Yeah. Um, At some point we'll have to do a, a, a chat on um, Slower than light versus faster than light communications and its impact on um, science fiction society. Yes. You know, when your trade information travels at the speed of ship, you know, the cargo gets there when you get the, at the same time, the message does. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now, that'd be really good one. Scott says, wasn't there some useful protected anchorages at Lady Gulf? I think the answer probably was yes. But the thing is, they, they weren't taking the island for the protected anchorages. They were taking the island to build airfields. So, right. Sean, do you have any final thoughts before we declare victory? Uh, no, uh, this, has been, this has been interesting. Uh, the unfortunate circumstances that uh, brought us to this uh, subject. 
Um, you know, I'd be very interested in hearing ultimately what caused the accident. Um, yeah, but this has been this has been an interesting little diversion, and uh, look forward to talking about the Wisconsin uh, next week. So, Sean, there's a question I'm throwing up that was specifically for you. While you're reading the question, I'm going to say, um, so everybody, it's been commented that we haven't heard anything from the crew in the news. I'm sure the crew is told to keep their mouth shut. Um, we haven't heard anything from the National Transportation Safety Board or any or the Coast Guard or anybody else. I suspect that we're going to hear some preliminary stuff from them relatively soon, but it's going to be very preliminary and it's not going to have, and it's really going to be more about, it's not going to be about why the accident happened. It's going to be about uh, about the salvage operation and the recovery operation and things like that. It's going to be a while before we actually get a report. Yeah. They actually have a website for that. Oh, they do? Yes. Unified Command. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing that Sal was really harping on is that, you know, who's in charge of this is going to be a big deal. Um, and and that's something that is entirely consistent with everything I've seen from the time I worked with the Navy is that if you a lot of times it really comes down to getting your command structure right. If you get the command structure right, then people go and do the thing that they're supposed to do and it's fine. Right. Yeah. But you one need the- to command structure right yeah one of the big things is that um the merchant marine um the south most of the salvage folks um epa um and the merchant mariners if they've had if they've had the training fire departments it's all they use they use the uh what they call unified command system yeah um and the training is long and it's very, very boring at times uh, because they go through all sorts of stuff. I went, I had to go through it about 20 years ago. So I understand the concepts, but I don't remember a lot of it. Um, get somebody who works in a big fire department. They'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, I see the, the question from the, uh, that you put up about uh, Chinese uh, reactors. They are, the answer is they are uh, mostly light water reactors. They are mostly pressurized water reactors, mostly uh, Western or derived from Western designs. Uh, The Chinese, they collaborated with the French uh, quite a bit. They collaborated some with the Russians and some with uh, U.S. uh, companies as well. So they're, they're mostly Western derived fairly new designs. First reactor in China came online in the early 1990s. So their industry is relatively new. Okay. Do they have a good reputation? Well, that's what I was trying to find out. And the, the IAEA has recently you know, commented somewhat favorably uh, on their uh, nuclear safety practices, but that's the, that's the open question. You know, it would be good from a climate change perspective for the Chinese to uh, you know, build out their nuclear power program so they're not using coal, but it does raise the issue of uh, nuclear safety. And you know, what little information I could find on it was uh, said lean favorable, but, but that is an open question. And it's, it's China, it's not a transparent society. So it's got that sort of a uh, you know, yellow flag, if you will. Yeah, yeah, recurring issue with the Chinese, so. All right. Well, I think with that in mind, I think it's probably time to go ahead and uh, declare victory. And so um, it, you guys are planning on coming back next week, right? We'll talk about the Wisconsin. You yes. All right. So sounds great. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I am, as always, I am appreciative of the fact that uh, a bunch of you decided to spend your Saturday evening listening to Uh, Me and my colleagues talk about science fiction and Navy stuff and maritime stuff and the intersection of all of the above. And with that, we will see you next time. Live long and prosper, everybody.